uh, about running the race. It's an important thing for us to decide we're going to do all the way to the end. And we talked about casting off the problems. That means we need to get need to get rid of sinful behaviors and patterns in our life. Those things need to go. And we need to continue with perseverance, which is cheerfully enduring all the way to the end. Okay, don't forget the cheerfully part. Okay, all the way to the end, and then concentrate your perception. That's basically we're focusing on Jesus. We're focusing on eternity, keeping our eyes on the goal so that we can run the race big important race we are part of in this life now this morning i want to talk about it will be worth it it will be worth it think of eternity there's a song we sing sometimes you know it i can only imagine what it will be like when i walk by your side i can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me i can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. And it says, I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Think of eternity. And I want to give you some scripture today that will help us do a little more than imagine what eternity will be like. So I've got some really good news for you, church. This world and this life is not all there is. And this is not some sci-fi fantasy movie. There really is eternity beyond this life. There really is. And we need to think about eternity. Last week, we need to stay focused on the goal, focused on the prize. That is eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand and have some idea of what we're headed for. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some great things in your future. And it's going to be awesome. Here's a fundamental question about eternity. What will we be like in eternity? In heaven, what will we be like? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 42, tells us a little bit about it. It says, The body that is sown is perishable but it is raised imperishable it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body if there's a natural body there's also a spiritual body and then a little bit later it says that our bodies will be immortal i like the description already Powerful, glorious, immortal, imperishable. Love it. Then in Luke 24, I think we get a little glimpse of what this spiritual body will be like when Jesus had been crucified and buried, and now he's risen again, and he's appearing to his disciples. In Luke 24, starting at verse 36, it says, While they were still talking about some things, Jesus himself himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Okay, This is the resurrected Jesus. I believe he is in his spiritual body, and it gives us a glimpse of what our spiritual bodies will be like in heaven. The disciples are together in a room, and suddenly Jesus just appears. It doesn't say he came through the door 
or crawled through a window, but he just appeared in the room. And they were startled. <laughs> Wouldn't you be? Somebody just, boop, there's somebody here. And so that's, that's, I can't do that, can you? I have to walk through a door. <laughs> but Jesus could just suddenly appear somewhere. But there's more than that. They thought he might be a ghost because he suddenly appeared, but he said, look, I have flesh and bones. So he, the spiritual body is not just some disconnected vapor thing. There's substance to the spiritual body. I think that's pretty cool. And I got good news too. He ate some food. So those eating fans in the house, myself included, we still get to eat in our spiritual bodies in heaven. In fact, Revelation talks about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, there's a great humongous feast that's going to happen when we first get into heaven. But a supernatural body we're going to have filled with power and glory and immortality. We get to live forever. Isn't that something? And I don't mean, okay, sometimes when you think of living forever, you think, well, do I really want that? But you're thinking in the natural. You know, with all the aches and pains and stuff, I'm not sure I want that to go on forever. But a powerful body that doesn't tire or wear out and live, can live forever, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Now, what will heaven be like? Revelation 22 describes it a little bit. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So there's going to be some rewards in heaven. And that's rewards for being obedient and doing the things that God has called us to do. Rewards for those things. Okay. Then in John 14, verse 2, Jesus talks about heaven a little bit. And he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And in the King James and some other versions of the Bible, it says that there are many mansions there. And he's going to prepare a place. And this was somewhere around 30 A.D. Okay? So almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus said he was going to prepare this place for his followers. Now, I just mentioned a little bit ago that Jacob and Christine are going to be coming back this way and be part of our staff here. And we anticipate for a couple of months they may live at our house until they kind of get settled and get their feet on the ground, all of that. And so we're preparing a place for them. Okay? We're trying to make sure there's a place they can stay at our house and feel like they're not just kids at mom and dad's house, you know, but kind of have their own little place. Can you imagine the preparation that Jesus is doing for us that's been going on for about 2,000 years? He's making a place. How fabulous could that possibly be? It's going to be incredible. In fact, the King James, I said, mentions mansions, but I think that's just an earthly term to give us an idea that it's going to be phenomenal. He's making a place for us. Then Revelation chapter 21 gives us a, a bit of a description where it talks about the holy city of Jerusalem, which I understand to be the capital city of heaven. Okay, This is not all of heaven, it's just the capital city. And it says, it comes out of heaven from God. And let me give you just some of the description. It's shown with the glory of God, and it's 1,400 miles wide, high, and long. Okay? You know how... 1,400 miles? You know, you go about five miles up in the sky and airplanes start to fall down. You know, that's, that's, they don't go a whole lot higher than that. 1,400 miles high and wide and long. That's humongous. It's pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. John says in Revelation, he says, I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. There will be no night there, and nothing impure will ever enter it. 
Again, I think these are human terms to describe what John was seeing of this city in heaven. Gold and precious jewels and all this stuff. It's kind of the best things we can think of. But it's even better than that. And then it goes on in another place and it says that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's what heaven will be like. No more death. No more sorrow. No more pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you. I do little exercises every day for my back because it tends to hurt. And everybody, I'm sure, could describe something they got that's not quite right. Guess what? In heaven, there's none of that. Everything works the way it's supposed to. And back in John 14, when Jesus was saying he's going to prepare a place, he says, so I'm going to come back for you and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. There's really the marker. Jesus in person. Okay? Not just, you know, I, I love the Word of God, but sometimes it... It's hard to understand. You know, it gives us pictures of what Jesus was like. But we're going to be able to see Jesus face to face when we get to heaven. Won't that be great? Then in Revelation 21, again, it says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then it says, and they will see his face. We get to see God face to face. Now that's only possible because of the spiritual bodies we're going to have. Because in the natural, the Scripture says, no one can see God and live. But we'll have a supernatural, immortal, powerful body, and we'll be able to stand in God's presence and see Him face to face. <laughs> How cool is that going to be? Wow. Wow. Okay, so we get a new body, we get great accommodations. What are we going to do? 2 Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we will also reign with Him. We get to be part of His kingdom government. Daniel 7, 26 and 27 says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey Him. So there's a further explanation of how the kingdom is going to work. We're going to be part of God's government and His kingdom and we will worship Him forever and ever. Now we had a pretty sweet experience this morning in our worship time. And I think that is a tiny little drop in the ocean of what worship can really be like in the presence of God. Yeah. If you felt a little bit fresh or it kind of moved or stirred this morning, imagine what it'll be like when you're right there in the presence of God experiencing it in its fullness. Holy moly! How great is that going to be? And I mentioned already, Revelation 22, verse 4, they will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. It's awesome. So we're not going to just sit around on fluffy clouds. I know that's kind of the pop imagery but no there's stuff to do in god's kingdom we get to be in his presence experiencing his power and glory up close and personal forever and ever <laughs> yes awesome so what should we do now 
with those things in mind, what should we do now? Well, let me read Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 and following. It says this. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join together in following, following my examples. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is is in their shame their mind is set on earthly things but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the lord jesus christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body therefore my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. You see, because we know this is all part of the future, He's going to transform us and we get to enter into His kingdom and live forever. We need to then keep our eyes focused on Him, eagerly await His appearing and stand firm in the faith. That's what we should do now. Let me give you another one. 2 Corinthians 4.18 We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we need to be focused and thinking about eternity. You know, one of the uh, part of a diagnosis of depression is you can't see beyond the moment. You're 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 just kind of stuck. But if you can see the future, wow, that gives you hope for another day and something better to come. And the Word of God is encouraging us to. Not just even think of what's going on later this afternoon or later this week, but what's going on in all of eternity that I get to be a part of. Yeah, I like it, Roger. Glory. That's right. I get to be part of that. C.S. Lewis said, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this. So he's saying, you know, focusing on the eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ helps us be even more effective now. I think there's some truth in that. Bob Kreps says Martin Luther once said that on his calendar there were only two days. Today and that day. And he recognized that every day of this life is preparation for the day when we will stand before God in eternity. I can view the world through spiritual eyes with God's perspective, or I can simply view the world through physical eyes and fail to grasp the eternal. My view of life will greatly affect my thinking and my actions. Isn't that pretty true? Ladies, if you're having company over, what do you do? 
you get the house ready, right? Yeah. That's what you do. So knowing something's coming up affects what you do right now. So if we know that eternity is before us, it affects what we do right now. Pastor Bob Coy says, what is a year or two or even 40 of waiting upon a matter here on earth when spiritually we are sitting in the lap of Jesus at the right hand of God? It, <laughs> he speaks in really modern vernacular. If we are freaking out over the issues of earth, it is, not because, it is because we are not exercising the faith to look at life from an eternal perspective from which our entire lifetime is but a vapor and a blip on the screen of eternity. Today, let us pray for the faith to see our trials as temporary as they truly are in the light of God's bigger picture of glory. Yeah, sometimes we get too focused on the moment and the circumstances that we are perhaps wrestling through right now. And it can really weigh us down. Okay? If we can keep our eyes on the goal, that gives us hope for a better future. Now, I am not saying you just ignore the issues of today. I am not saying that. But you cannot be consumed by the issues of the moment. You've got to have an eternal perspective and keep pressing on towards that goal. Hebrews 11, the, uh, the Faith Hall of Fame. Abraham was a man of great faith and he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Moses was a man of great faith and he was looking ahead to his reward. And then it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. And they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And listen to this. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things know that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to, to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These people were looking forward to the reward that was before them, and they didn't see it in their own lifetime. But they still had a future outlook. And it drove them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on this earth. Guess what? If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're an alien. You're a little green man. Not really, but you understand what I'm saying. This world, if you're a follower of Christ, this world is really not your home. Your citizenship is in heaven. How many have been outside of the country? So you get an idea of what I'm talking about. You can visit another country and have a good time there, meet people, whatever. Even, you might even live there for a long term, but it's not home. My citizenship is at home. And on a spiritual level, this world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven, in eternity, in the kingdom. So we are aliens and strangers. And the world is knowing, noticing that more and more, how strange we really are. <laughs> And actually, truth, truth be told, we ought to stick out just a little bit as unusual. There ought to be something different about us. And I don't mean being weird for the sake of being weird, okay? Uh, although that can be fun. Uh, <laughs> I mean being strange because you adhere to the Word of God 
and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ when everybody else is dissonant. And you try to live a holy life when everybody else is saying, go for whatever you want. No rules, no nothing matters. But you live by standards that God lays out. That ought to make you be a little different than the people around you. We are aliens and strangers on this world. Okay. Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so, you know, here's another angle on this. Eternity can help us get through the tough times that we face on this life. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Someday, in eternity, in the kingdom of God, I think we can look back on the things of this life and say, what was I all uptight about? That really didn't matter. whoop de doo David R. Reagan says, one of the keys to living a triumphant life in Christ, to living a joyous and victorious life in the midst of a world wallowing in despair, is to live with a conscious, eternal perspective. And then he says, I have personally found this to be so important that I carry a reminder of it in my shirt pocket at all times. It's a small card that was sent to me in 1988 by the great prophetic preacher Leonard Ravenhill. The card says, Lord, keep me eternity conscious. And then he says, what does that mean? In the words of Peter, that means living as aliens and strangers in this world. Similarly, similarly, that's kind of a tricky word. You ever tried to pronounce that similarly? Similarly. (laughs) Similarly. In the words of the writer of Hebrews, it means living as strangers and exiles on this earth. And Paul put it this way, Do not set your minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis explained that to live with an eternal perspective means living as commandos operating behind the enemy lines, preparing the way for the coming of the (laughs) commander-in-chief. Yeah. Yeah. That's about right. So if we look at life from an earthly perspective, we tend to be filled with sorrow, and our faith can be weak. But if we look at life from an eternal perspective, we can be filled with joy and hope and have a strong faith in God. And even though we will have some difficult times, we will see some troubling things in our life, we can be able to say with the Scriptures, surely God is good. He is. Colossians 3, one. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Church, you know, this whole heaven thing is something that is just part of being a Christian that I think sometimes we take it for granted. And we need once in a while just to be reminded of the eternity that is before us. And as I began the sermon, I said this is not from some sci-fi or fantasy movie. This is reality. There really is eternity beyond this life. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is out of this world beyond your wildest dreams. Good. We need to remember that and let it affect us today. There's an old hymn. It says, Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem 
Just go to Him in prayer. Life's day will soon be over. All storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory, safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven. A harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burden down. And then the chorus. Some of you know the song. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face all sorrows will erase so bravely run the race till we see christ yeah it will be worth it all this life is a tiny little blip in all of eternity And God has so much more in store for us. So whatever you're facing right now, if you're in a difficult circumstance and your life is in turmoil, I want you to know there are better days ahead. There are better days ahead. God has an eternal plan for you. And it really is out of this world. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I love it. How about you? Are you encouraged today? This world is not the way God intended it to be. And this world is not the way it's going to always be. There is heavenly eternity yet to come. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Yes. Let's stand.